good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends. Now, I uh, welcome to, to the session on the book discussion on language development in Indonesia. I think the keynote speaker from Professor Mulyanto has given us the context and relevance of this book. But I think all of you may agree with me that if you talk about land, it is such a complex, very, very complex issues involve the political, economic, social, cultural, even a regulation dimension in it. It's still, still fresh in my mind, uh, in our mind, the, the recent case of the uh, acclamation, uh, reclamation in Kosovo Jakarta, which involved a very strong nuance of political, environmental, or even economic dimension. Uh, not mentioning yet other issues, for example, in, in Papua, where um, uh, land mapping, timely or reformulation seems to prove to be very, very difficult to the diverse ethnic groups where everybody claim themselves as the tribal leaders. So it's another unresolved issues full of challenges. And if you speak about the regulation aspect, no guarantee sufficient regulation will be the end of everything. Because uh, my colleague, uh, Nina Alexandra, wrote a chapter on land, and she mentioned that there is about 600 regulations on land raising from the Undang-Undang to state law to the ministry decision that is either overlapping or even contradictory in its nature. And for sure, the incidence of land conflict has risen from years to years. I just have a not to update the data, but from 2006 to 2012, there's about 232 cases. It's a tip of an iceberg. So, in this case, we have had seven presidential administrations. And for me personally, I did not see, or yet see, any breakthrough in trying to solve the language in Indonesia, but we still hope towards Jokowi administration. I was fortunate to be able to read a few chapters of this book. So the key words are land, development, social justice, and religious conflict. The question is now, can we really achieve this and this balance it, or make a professional way to achieve such goal? And it's also for me personally ironic to see the subtitle of this book, which is Searching for People's Sovereignty. That means that so that it tends to be missing or non-existent. It is ironic because I see that sovereignty should be the foundation of land arrangement. And I quote from this book, there is just too many political rhetoric when dealing with land issues in Indonesia. And it's this opportunity I'm honored to have four authors of this book, and I will give a short introduction. In my far right is Professor Catherine Robinson, she is a professor of anthropology in the School of Culture, History, and Language at the NND College of Asia and Pacific. Her area of expertise are gender specific studies, anthropology, religions, and religious studies, and at the Department of Anthropology. On my right is Professor John McCarthy. He is also with the NND Graduate School and specializes on the question of governance, institution, and global development. In my left is uh, Dr. Soraya Afif. She is a lecturer at the Department of Anthropology at the Faculty of Social and Political Science, University of Indonesia. And she is also the director of the Center of Anthropological Studies at UI, where her research interests include climate change, land and forest tenure and green development debates. And on my far left is Dr. Dilip Kujala. He is an assistant professor of urban and regional planning at the Bandung Institute of Technology. For the order of uh, presentation, I will follow the order of uh, authors from the book. So, for the first opportunity, I'll uh, give the opportunity to Professor John McCarthy for 15 minutes. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to first of all thank CSIS for hosting us here and for everyone for um, coming along and for all uh, the people helping to launch the book today. Um, for Professor Woody for giving the uh, interesting discussion just then. Um, just by way of preliminary comments, 
I just want to mention, um, very recently I went to a workshop in Myanmar where they asked some um, outside people to come and help give some input into some of the challenges they're facing in, in Myanmar. And uh, this was quite interesting um, because it gives a point of comparison for, for Indonesia. Um, the first thing that really struck me is that many in the region, and I had people from across ASEAN, um, as well as other places, were particularly impressed by the kind of the, the transition that Indonesia has seen in the last 18 years. I see the other day it, it is 18 years since Indonesia made the transition from uh, the authoritarian period of Pak uh, Sahato to the new era. Um, the move to democracy and the large number of governance reforms are really quite um, impressive. Um, and people, the second thing that I really noticed is that people in other countries in Asia really look to Indonesia in, in some ways like an older brother. They, they look at the things that are happening in Indonesia and they see some of the innovations. Um, particularly, for instance, in the area of land, the One Map Initiative, Indonesia's fascinating experiment with decentralization and many other initiatives, and I found this particularly interesting. Um, the other thing that I really noticed, the third point that, out of the workshop, was that if you, they made a list of all the issues that Myanmar faces, and uh, there was also a paper that I read at the same time which looked at Cambodia and Laos, and if you look at the list of land and forest and other developmental problems, and you see them listed for Myanmar, if you put your white paper there and you wiped out the word Myanmar and you put Indonesia there, you would see many of the same problems. Of course, Indonesia has come a lot, a lot further, but in respect to land and development, the list of problems is very similar. And I think you can see that there's a lot of unfinished business to do with land. Um, so in writing the book, um, first of all, it's really, uh, well, in reviewing all the chapters of, and all the other authors, I should mention there's a couple of other authors here um, Patrick and our colleagues from uh, Akatiga, uh, uh, Sony and Aprila, uh, 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 are also here. Unfortunately, we couldn't have all our authors here, but I'd like to acknowledge their presence. Um, why, would, why do countries want to pursue a land, um, create a more functional land tenure system? I think it's really important to begin this um, with this. Firstly, we need a good land tenure system for inclusive local development and to enhance and uh, protect local livelihoods. To, and also to address so many questions to do with economic development, as well as for good environmental and infrastructure planning and for more effective forest management. And as we look around Indonesia today, you can see the need to do this effectively is becoming even more urgent. Uh, just to mention all the conflicts, um, but there's obviously increasing demand for land. There's enormous pressure for privatizing land, uh, transforming customary for all sorts of land into an individual title. And then we have a lot of corporate actors wanting to gain control over large areas of land. So all these things make um, land an increasingly hot issue in Indonesia. Um, and also, apart from this, we see what some people call Indonesia's developmental anomaly. And this anomaly is the fact that although Indonesia has had quite high economic growth, we still see uh, ever higher um, rates of inequality and increasing relative poverty. But, you know, the poverty rate is getting lower, but it's not getting lower as fast as, ever, as people would like. And I think you can see this as being very much related to the land issue. So if you push the this is a quote from a, a paper from the East West Center that compared um, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Indonesia. And one of their conclusions is that one of the obstacles in all three countries, all three countries in what various ways have been trying to democratize, um, but deeply vested uh, interests, they concluded, in, within these countries were really um, outweighing the support for both inside government and in civil society for reform. And I, I think this is a quite interesting um, comment. Okay, go ahead. Now, if you look at Indonesia in the international context, you can see so many countries face these same questions. Uh, but in trying to think of a way to bring together the papers in the book, 
we actually identified these as perhaps the most critical questions that are emerging for Indonesia. Firstly, Indonesia has this history of agrarian reform. Um, in the, as a heritage of the revolution, there was always this emphasis on agrarian justice in Indonesian political discourse. So the question is, how relevant is agrarian reform to poverty alleviation today? Some people say it's less uh, relevant, other people say it's more relevant. And um, Pak Soni and the colleagues at Akatika wrote a very interesting paper on this point, if you want to read about, uh, about, about this. The second question is, how might Indonesia go about formalising um, title to land? Uh, the third question is, how to address the insecure tenure of marginal groups, such as the, um, uh, the customary, the other question, which um, uh, Ibu Kathy is going to talk about today. Um, the next question is how to support carbon sequestration and curtail deforestation, which Ibu Soraya is going to talk about. And then how to address the question of rapid land acquisitions, which Patrick has a chapter on uh, who's here today. So maybe one of the best questions that you could uh, address with Patrick. Finally, how to secure tenure for the urban poor, which Pak um, Delik is going to address. So what I'm, what I'm going to address the first two questions in that list very briefly now, because I'm already used that quite a bit of my time. Um, how to deal with the poverty and, and um, land tenure question. Um, now this is a quote from two economists in the World Bank, and everyone in Indonesia now is talking so much about um, food security, but nobody, like, at least I haven't seen in the press, many discussions about land, food security that tie it to land. And this quote, I put this quote here because, in fact, there is a quite intense, quite close um, connection between food security and land. If you go to a farming community, you will find that a farmer who doesn't own the land, who is working on someone else's land, a farmer, Buggy Hasil, he gives a third of his rice over to the person that um, who owns the land. He or she also um, gives usually costs of about a third of their production to pay for the cost of production. So they get to keep a third of the rice that they produce, which is why in many rural communities you find land, um, sharecroppers as, as food insecure people because they run out of rice before the next harvest. So this connection between um, food security and land is often overlooked. In fact, in Indonesia's agrarian law, the social function of land is very much emphasised. So we need to keep this connection in mind. Uh, please move it. And then, in relation to this poverty question, we found a report in reviewing the, um, in preparing the introductory chapter, where somebody estimated that 68% of Indonesia's land area is under various concession licences whether they be oil palm, timber, or mining licenses. And then we have around 60 to 70% of Indonesia's land surface considered to be Kawasan Hutan. So this leaves a very limited amount of land available for people to cultivate. In fact, one report suggested that uh, one third of the Indonesian villages are actually functionally landless. So the question then is, does land reform provide a way out of poverty for all these people? Now, Jeff Nielsen actually wrote a paper, which is also in the book, which looks at this question, and he argues that incomes have become much more diverse in many parts of Indonesia. You find that um, the way out of poverty is no longer tied to, to land, so intensely. If people leave the land, they become, they diversify their livelihoods, they go off to the city. Um, uh, so there's this argument that livelihoods have become much more lo less local, and because land has become more fragmented, the land uh, reform agenda is no longer as relevant as it was in the past. And if we move forward, now of course, the interesting point is in Sony's chapter, Sony and Aprilia's chapter, they make the argument that um, agriculture is still the largest employer, in fact, and policies to support small-scale farming are incredibly important because so many people are still on the land. Um, so they argue that Indonesia needs to develop, needs to develop much more effective policies to limit uh, uh, absentee land ownership. If you go to many villages, you'll find there'll be 10 or 15 or 20 hectares that individual people own, even rice land, who don't live in the village. And they do a survey of various parts of Indonesia to look at how this works and how it's getting worse, in fact. 
Um, and finally, we have the problem that um, there is a challenge of developing much better state regulations and governance measures to protect the bat against these large-scale land acquisitions. If Indonesia can no longer do land reform because it's too difficult, at least I think one of the things that uh, Indonesia could do is more effectively protect the rights of people who do have land and um, stop um, the excessive concentration of land, which I think could help diminish increasing inequality, which I talked about earlier. Okay, now, so that was the first question I was going to address, the question of the connection between poverty and land. The second question is one of uh, this question of how to improve access and security of land tenure through titling and formalization. Now, we have a number of chapters in the book on this. Um, but, so briefly, what is formalization of land tenure? It's basically recognizing and registering people's legal right to land in a land registry. And um, uh, so Pierre Van Eng looks back over 200 years of attempts over time to do formalization. I, I found this a, this is a quite interesting chapter for those of you who want to look at the history of land problems in Indonesia. And he says that after 200 years of trying to sort this out, Indonesia still hasn't succeeded. So what we see in agrarian law is this is a very ambitious law that wants to give um, settled title to the whole of Indonesia. And this law was passed 50 years ago, I think. And Indonesia still hasn't achieved this ambition. So the question is, is this agenda still relevant? Um, now, of course, there is an alternative. The World Bank tried to get back at another formalization project just a few years ago, which, if you look, read the assessment report, suggests that um, it didn't work out as nicely as they hoped. They actually gave it a poor rating in terms of its degree of success. So this suggests this approach has certain limitations. I won't go into the literature. There's a wide literature looking at uh, why these approaches often don't work out as well as they should. So the alternative actually is building on existing tenure arrangements that are already alive and working across rural Indonesia. Uh, for instance, Peter talks about um, using the letter that the local government uses to confirm the payment of land taxes to build on this uh, and create a land tenure system based on the actual kind of transactions we get. And also, there's a Surat Kutaranantana, the, the uh, certificate that um, is developed at the Kachamatan level involving the village heads. Use these kind of informal and de facto systems. It's a way that local or other communities actually negotiate land. It's not formalized, but these systems can be actually slowly recognized and brought within the, um, under the umbrella of the law and given protection from land grabbers and absentee land grabbers. So this is a, the kind of agenda I think Indonesia could, could approach. This would be a participatory approach, building on what actually works already. And I think uh, I always admire the creativity of a lot of Indonesian policy makers. And I think this is somewhere where they could really do some really innovative things that could show some lessons to other countries around Southeast Asia. OK, so that's all I'm going to say to that. I'll pass it on now to you all can. Thanks to CSRS for hosting this and to Pakuri and everyone in the Indonesia project, Ibu Luka and Kate and, and Lydia, who, um, was, who gave us um, so much help in this marathon task of getting the, the book out. Well, uh, how many months? Not seeing in very few number of months after the, uh, after the conference. So thanks to all of you and thanks to all of our authors, and I'm really pleased that so many of them are here today. Um, I'm just going to try and talk a little bit about these questions about um, um, uh, the question of ADA and the question of community rights and how that might be dealt with. And can we have the first slide? I just want to show you this slide that um, popped up on my computer that I took in Kogas. And I think it illustrates really well the, 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 the real issue in Indonesia, which is this issue about not just diversity, but about the way that that diversity has come about through this extraordinary mixing of people over the years. You know, these are these Papuan women, probably some of them migrants from Biak. Um, they're Muslims. Um, they're wearing their, um, their, their sarong kabaya, their nice um, north coast java batiks. Um, and they're doing, I forget what you call that dance, but it's that dance that we usually associate with uh, 
you know, my book will through to the Philippines, but people are looking to me or something. Anyway, I just thought this slide absolutely illustrates beautifully um, the kind of issues that come up when you're trying to talk about um, custom difference, uh, custom rights and so on in Indonesia. So next slide. Um, now I think one thing that comes through strongly um, in the book in a number of chapters is this issue about um, the, the persistent duality in the ways of thinking about land. Remember John ended up by talking about the need for something that's a bit more subtle and nuanced and so on. Um, and uh, uh, Amy and Ben's chapter is an absolutely wonderful chapter um, which uh, looks at the history of the development of land law in the colonial regime and this uh, binary that developed between titling of land that was in the areas controlled by the colonial government um, and then the idea about other, um, which was the way that um, land rights were recognised um, in the other areas. And um, uh, so this colonial idea was an essentializing of difference. Um, this idea that you had autochthonous populations, um, which, um, thinking back to my first slide, um, doesn't really uh, fit the complexity and cultural dynamism of the people of the archipelago. Um, but this kind of customary law um, uh, was, was still active and rich in many parts of the archipelago right up to the beginning of the 20th century where the Dutch um, uh, operated through indirect rule rather than um, you know, direct uh, regulation as they, they did in Java. Um, and I think there's a wonderful chapter by Nancy Peluso about Sinkawan and it's, um, the paper's got a focus on uh, small scale mining but um, the background um, we, um, I think was absolutely spot on. I, I've got to thank you for your wonderful introduction but he was absolutely spot on when he emphasised the importance of history. Um, and uh, Nancy's chapter shows how in this area you had Chinese populations who migrated into that area in the 18th century who had, they were farming people and um, had rights that were recognised both by the colonial government and by the local people. But um, a new historical discourse, you know, we're, we're very, all over the world, we're very good at, you know, backwards revising of history. And that history became revised after 1965 when you had the equation of Chinese with communism. So those people um, lost their rights. Um, and, um, and I think that's a wonderful example because and it's an extreme example that shows the real difficulties of actually deciding who are the originary populations, you know, how far back do you want to go? Um, now, the, um, the 1945 constitution recognised the importance of land as the basis of all of the constituent societies and cultures of the archipelago. Um, and, you know, ideas about relationships to land, regulations of land, practices about land, as Woody was saying, um, are all part of this mix of cultural diversity. But um, the, the, um, the, the, the constitution, um, and reinforced later by the, um, the um, basic agrarian law, tried to get rid of this um, binary feature of land regulation that came out of the colonial period, tried to have a unitary land law. But I think it's been really clear that this, this unitary land law, as John was saying, um, you know, hasn't been very successful in trying to sort out all of the issues that arise um, with respect to people's access to land. Um, both um, issues about land, as Papua was saying, as the fundamental basis of existence for so many, um, so many people in Indonesia, and especially those who live in the forest zone, what's designated as the forest zone, um, but also um, the, um, uh, yeah, just the, uh, sorry, I was going to say that, never mind, let's move on. Um, so, oh, sorry, no, I'm moving on, I'm still on the same slide, sorry. So, can we just go back to the previous slide? Um, so, um, under the new order government, this eminent domain power that was enshrined in the constitution was, um, was taken as a, um, a, you know, as a doctrine which um, um, really fitted well with the government ideology of Pembangunan. Um, and I've put um, a little image there, some of you may remember Renan's play Sukunaga, The Struggle of the Naga Drug. 
um, which was a play about the struggle of uh, a group of indigenous people who find themselves dispossessed of their land by um, enclosure by the government on behalf of a mining company. And this book came out when I was doing my doctoral research in Sorrow. I'll go to the next slide. Um, and also, uh, Jamie David Davidson has a very nice paper in the book which talks about this eminent domain power and he talks about it um, in relation to um, the Jokowi agenda for infrastructure development as another really fundamental aspect of poverty alleviation and development in Indonesia. And I noticed really compass this morning, there's a story about um, the slow progress um, in building all of the electricity plants. And one of the uh, hamatan that's identified is this problem of actually getting access to land. So I thought, hmm, that's a good advertisement for our book. Um, but um, uh, um, now, my own research for the last, I think, 40 years or something, um, has been on and off um, dealing with the situation of, in the Sorowako Nickel Project um, in the northernmost part of um, South Sulawesi. Um, and I think um, in my paper um, I, I talk about um, the kinds of things that have been happening there and go back to the, um, the issues of the, the way that those people were basically tossed off their land um, actually at gunpoint um, in the early 1970s uh, to make way for this foreign mining, uh, mining project. And I'll show you a couple of pictures in a minute. But the point I want to make is that um, I think this project exemplifies really well um, this way in which when this kind of binary way of thinking about it, that you've got this formal kind of title which is um, valorised by the state, but these less formal kinds of titles like customary tenure, etc., that aren't so valued and are, 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 are can be easily read, read rough, rough shot over, you've already got the makings of a, a script of resistance. And the script of resistance, which I saw in Sorowako, and which I think has been played out many times throughout the archipelago, is that the people began defending their rights in terms of their identity as the Oran Asli. Uh, and this idea that as the Oran Asli, as the Tuantana, they had special privilege rights to benefit from this project. Now, um, this has never really, um, it's kind of been a, a long story, but. Um, they still retain this very strong sense of themselves as having been wronged because of that early dispossession. Um, and I think this is a really common response. And um, I remember you know, being in Sulawesi in 1998-1999 um, and all over the place, there were these hand-written signs that people um, hammered into you know, sugar fields and all sorts of fields saying, we're not really so all sorts of communities that had their land um, forcibly you know, taken from them um, uh, in the interest of um, development projects which usually favoured um, private enterprise, um, they took uh, advantage of the rhetoric of Pabodaya and also the, the opening up of democratic space that happened um, during the period of Reformasi to reclaim their rights. Now I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures um, from Sorowako. Um, this is a picture I took last year and what you're looking at is uh, Sawa, which is being developed around um, golf greens. Um, and this picture shorthand um, tells you a long story that the people lost their land not for anything productive, not for anything that was going to generate income for the Republic of Indonesia or anybody else. They lost their sour because the company wanted to build a golf course there for its expatriate employees. Now, one of the struggles that's gone on within this idiom of um, uh, indigenous rights discourse is that, um, uh, especially since Revolasi, the people have been able to negotiate to get their land back kind of on loan. So um, uh, these mostly old ladies, but a few old men, um, go out there and they have to sign an agreement with the company that says that um, if they or anyone you know, working for them gets hit with a golf ball, they're not going to sue the company. But the ladies say, no, we know when we see them at all the greens and they start to tee up, we, you know, we get out, we, we go and stand over a tree. We see the next photo. And I just want to show you this very bad photo because I photographed it on the wall of um, one of my friends in Sorowako, um, who's the man. Um, Second from, um, hang on, I'll just get right and left, 
this way. Would be second from uh, second from the right. This guy here, and the Basso. Um, now, um, this he's got this picture on his wall, and the wall is his story of his his struggle for the land of his people. Um, and this is a picture of himself, his cousin, his father, some of his uncles who were um, locked up in Palopo in the district capital um, in 1974 because they protested um, and they, they said that they had the right to be involved in a direct negotiation with the mining company over the compensation for their land. Um, uh, and, and so the, the solution was to kind of lock them up on the assumption that without their leadership the resistance would um, disappear, but it didn't happen. But um, uh, anyway, um, next slide. Now, um, I said that um, what happened in Sarawaka, which is what's happened in a lot of parts of Indonesia, is that when people feel dispossessed, um, they fall back on increasingly on ideas about uh, indigeneity, orang asli, masyarakat ada, and so on. And I just wanted to talk briefly about what this indigenous rights discourse is. It's a global discourse. Um, as we know, there are all sorts of instruments like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, but the thing is, it's got its origins in societies like my own, in settler colonies. So the idea about Indigenous Peoples' rights really emerged as a discourse in um, Canada, the United States, South Africa, Australia. We had um, indigenous, you have existing populations, let's leave the indigenous word out for the moment, um, who were there when their lands were violently, violently occupied by separate col colonialists from Europe um, during the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, now, um, it's, uh, some people are critical of the Indonesian government because it's been a signatory, it's a signatory to the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but it refuses to use the term indigenous. Um, uh, and you know, there's all, and uh, Patrick's got a very nice, no, it's not yours, text paper in the book, which talks very interestingly about um, all of the different terminologies, masyarakat adat, masyarakat hukum adat, and so on, that have been used to describe this, um, this, this concept. But um, Papur is gone now, but I mean, he's absolutely right about the important historical nature of the development of these kinds of concepts and identities. And so I think um, what seemed to me to be happening was that this was emerging as a global discourse um, at the same time as you had this growing discontent um, in Indonesia and also in the Philippines um, about the ways that people's rights uh, which they expressed in terms of customary rights were not being recognised. Um, now, there's an awful lot of these global instruments that are, are in place, and which um, Patrick's paper, for example, finally got to Patrick, <laughs> is about um, uh, asking the question, um, do, do instruments like um, you know, the, the uh, voluntary agreements of the um, round table on sustain sustainable palm oil um, that require uh, free, prior and informed consent um, in situations where the local population, um, the occupiers of the land for the plantation are deemed to be indigenous. Um, um, it, it does that serve as a proxy for a strong uh, legal instrument within a country recognising indigenous rights? We're going to have to read the chapter to get a really interesting answer to that important question. But you've got other instruments like the, the Performance Standard 7 from the International Finance Corporation. So again, uh, companies operating in Indonesia, um, like for example, um, the, 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 uh, the um, agro-business described in the chapter by uh, Luxmi uh, and Price in, in Papua. Um, they are obliged, if they want to get money from the International Finance Corporation, if the people are deemed to be indigenous in terms of the criteria of the PS7, they have to have certain standards in place in terms of resettlement. But also, very importantly, there's been global NGO activism, and so that we've got these global networks who support um, people in countries like Indonesia who want to express 
their, um, their, their, their land rights uh, and their dispossession in terms of the Indigenous identities. And so, for example, my mate, Andy Vasso, who was locked up in Palopo, um, went to uh, Canada when uh, 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 Sororoco was still being operated by PT, uh, by International Nickel, which was a subsidiary of International Nickel. Um, uh, some uh, activists in Canada arranged to bring uh, indigenous people was the term that they used from northern Canada, from uh, Nicaragua and from Indonesia, who were given uh, proxies to attend a shareholders meeting. So, you know, this is the way that this discourse operates, uh, you know, as a kind of a global discourse. So, can we have the next slide? Um, now, what's been happening in um, Indonesia? Well, I think quite a lot has been happening, actually. There's a lot, um, there's been a lot of um, talk about what might be done, there's a lot of plans on the table, but um, uh, a really important thing, of this one's been out of order, but was the, um, the Constitutional Court decision in 2012 um, in response to a challenge that was brought by Amman that decided that the rights of these other communities in the forest areas um, had the same sorts of rights as private title in, in the forestry areas, like the forestry department could no longer um, deem that land to be you know, theirs to do what they wanted with. And I've just put this picture up. There's a whole other story going on in Sorocco that I can't really talk about, but um, it has not time, but with the current CA or the doggy, uh, people who fled during the Darul Islam rebellion and who've since come back since Reform um, But this is, a, this is a little sign that they put up um, after that constitutional court decision, which in their minds was already a kind of a statement of their rights to claim. Yeah, next slide. So um, here I've just talked about um, well, some of the things we've already covered. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was this last point on this slide, that um, I think we can see, so what are we talking about when we're talking about Indigenous identities? Like I was saying, that this idea originated um, in the context of um, the struggles of fourth world peoples like the Australian Aborigines, um, in my own country where there's a big debate now going on about whether Indigenous people um, should be part, included in the Constitution or whether in fact there should be a treaty that recognises the sovereignty of those people before my convict ancestors and all those other white people came. Um, so it, it seems to me that it's not easy to map the complexity of these local um, identities and these, this amazing diversity of cultural practices and with respect to land and so on, onto that sort of idea of indigenous. You know, there is a, I mean, I mean, you know, I think the Indone Indonesian government, um, that, that's what's behind this, you know, refusal to use, well, I don't know, that's what I'm guessing, to use the term indigenous, but to use these, um, you know, Indonesian terms like masyarakat gugum adat or masyarakat adat, that at least have some sort of gesture to um, local histories and cultures. Um, and um, what I want to argue is that this idea of indigenous identity, which, and if you look at the um, 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 uh, exposition of what's entailed in that identity, it's, it's, it's got ideas about communalism, sharing, egalitarianism, and so on. And it seems to me that it's, we can really read it as an expression of an anti-free market or anti-neoliberal ideology. Um, and uh, there's some recent work being uh, written by some French scholars, Dada and Laval, um, where they wanted to develop this idea of the commune, which is not the same as commune and it's not the same as uh, the commons. Um, but the, the idea of um, this uh, political sentiment of holding values in common but also a political agenda to um, work towards um, um, doing things in a, in a collective and egalitarian way. And they're talking about these um, movements that have sprung up in Europe as a response to the, the economic crisis, especially in, in Southern Europe. Um, and so, yeah, they're saying it's a new analytical category and a form of practice. And it seems to me that the expression of indigenous rights um, uh, uh, oh, the Aman kind of idea of or, or, or my friends in Sarawaka with their expression, it's a similar kind of it's a similar kind of impulse that they're they um, they're drawing on their history and their cultural practices to form a political discourse which is resisting 
um, you know, a kind of a neoliberal market-driven discourse, um, you know, with you know the the, the, the sort of the promise of, of trickle down for the dispossessed, you know, that the, the people have to give up their land for the greater good, and that the that the market and the impulse of the market um, is seen as having greater force and greater import than um, the other kinds of values um, that people have shared um, within their communities. So it seems to me that's a useful, um, you know, a useful area of trying to analyse and understand what's happening um, with the claims for, for Indigenous rights. It doesn't get you tied up in arguments about autophony and who is here first. And, um, and we have the next slide. Um, uh, it may just think this is the last one. Um, and I think, you know, um, we've had this um, uh, ministerial decree in um, uh, recent years, sorry I've lost my notes here, but this idea of hut communal. And hut communal is a very nice kind of idea, I think, that sidesteps those issues about autophony or origin or something like that, because hut communal um, only has a sort of a, a standard of proof, if you like, of people having lived together and worked collectively, etc., etc., for a period of 10 years. So it deals with the dynamic, vibrant, um, migrating populations of Indonesia. Um, the other term that I, I think is becoming quite common is this term of orang lokal, which I think has sprung up partly in response to um, some of the requirements of corporate social responsibility law, where companies are required to have some sort of engagement with the people in their vicinity. Um, and so orang lokal is a bit similar, I think, to the sense of hak communal, that it doesn't rely on autophony or um, some sort of notion of prior origins, but um, it's, it's about, you know, um, the people who are living in an area, um, working the land in an area, um, et cetera, et cetera, and identifying the kinds of rights that they might have in relation to um, resettlement or enclosure or whatever to do with um, capital intensive projects like mining and plantations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Environmentalism is very important and very particular in Indonesia to not look up. Uh, so, paper ini tidak bicara tentang kegagalan program-program uh, lingkungan di Indonesia, tetapi sebenarnya saya ingin argue bahwa program-program lingkungan terutama yang terakhir uh, setelah uh, SBY dan juga berlanjut pada zaman Jokowi ini membuka sesuatu di mana efek dari sesuatu itu adalah ruang untuk melakukan arrangement terhadap makanan. Sebenarnya itu. So, uh, nah, uh, yang uh, untuk bicara pada zaman kita melihat pada zaman Jokowi ini, maka mau tidak mau kita harus kembali kepada bagaimana sebenarnya global dari environmental reform di Indonesia. Jadi, ada, saya melihatnya, sorry, saya melihatnya ada tiga global di dalam environmental reform di Indonesia. First Global pertama itu adalah pada zaman kolonial, di mana pada zaman itu sebenarnya mulai dibuat reserve di cagar alam, daerah-daerah uh, uh, yang di, kemudian dikeluarkan dari kawasan-kawasan untuk produksi. Dan ada sekitar 67 cagar-cagar alam yang terbentuk pada zaman uh, kolonial itu. Ya. Jadi mulainya pada 19, uh, sekitar 19. Nah, gelombang kedua adalah, adalah gelombang pada zaman uh, Soeharto sampai kira-kira ini tetap berlangsung ya, uh, jadi ada paham juga. Jadi gelombang kedua itu mulai dengan di kalau dalam tim sosial ada teritorialisasi dan negara untuk kemudian mengklaim tiga per empat dari wilayah Indonesia menjadi kawasan hutan. Dalam kawasan hutan kemudian ada kawasan-kawasan yang kemudian dizonasi mana untuk produksi, mana untuk proteksi dan segala macam. Nah, kawasan uh, itu menghasilkan sekitar 20, 17 sampai 20 persen kawasan yang kemudian menjadi kawasan konservasi. Di mana sebelumnya ini punya efek terhadap masyarakat yang tinggal di sana. Nah, gelombang ketiga, which is itu yang menjadi fokus dari artikel saya adalah gelombang 
di mana mulai environmental reform itu berkaitan dengan climate change di mana perubahan mana kawasan-kawasan ini kemudian dilakukan arrangement atau perubahan pengelolaan perbedaan pengelolaan di dalam lahan yang semuanya berefek kepada uh, apa namanya masyarakat. Nah, tetapi yang saya ingin katakan bahwa pada gelombang ketiga ini uh, kita lihat masuknya proyek-proyek lingkungan terutama yang terkait dengan uh, dalam hal ini untuk Indonesia adalah tempat uh, reduction emission for demolition and reporting in Indonesia. Apa yang terjadi pada zaman ini, pada ketika diskurs tentang climate change sebenarnya ini masuknya? Dan dalam hal ini saya tidak bicara tentang gagal atau tidak gagal, bukan itu intinya. Menurut saya membuka space apa yang uh, diskurs ini atau reform ini. Nah, oleh sebab itu uh, sesuatu yang untuk uh, memahami apa yang terjadi sekarang dan bagaimana melihat sekarang zaman setelah uh, Jokowi ini adalah mulai pada dimulai reform atau diskurs ini atau environmental yang terkait dengan ini mulai pada zaman SBY, terutama pada setelah uh, SBY kemudian punya komitmen tentang uh, bahwa Indonesia akan uh, memprotek atau menurunkan emisi 26% dari uh, apa namanya deficit obesitas. Ini kemudian Indonesia kemudian menjadi negara yang menarik sekali uh, bagi negara-negara E, bagi negara-negara donor yang ingin menaruhkan uangnya di sini. Jadi uh, hampir semua negara yang yang sebenarnya tertarik untuk kemudian melihat red sebagai bagian untuk mitigasi climate change ini menaruh uang di Indonesia. Nah. Hal yang paling uh, menarik adalah Project Norway. Saya tidak bicara tentang berapa banyak, tapi apa yang dikrisi atau yang di, di, uh, muncul atau emerge dari project ini. Nah, ini penting untuk kemudian melihat bagaimana project ini membawa political space apa. Norway menaruh uangnya dengan syarat bahwa ini harus dikelola di luar kementerian hutanan. Artinya di luar sektor-sektor yang dilihat banyak orang bermasalah. Ditaruhlah red ini di satu uh, apa namanya institusi yang namanya UKP4 di mana langsung di bawah presiden. Dan ini penting gambar ini memperlihatkan bagaimana segas red itu sebenarnya berada di atas semua sektor-sektor yang ada di Indonesia. Terutama sektor yang menguasai lahan terbesar di Indonesia yaitu Kementerian Utama. Ini membuat upset banyak orang kementerian, tetapi untuk civil society, this is the peluang. Dan peluang inilah yang kemudian dipakai demikian buka untuk mempromosikan kembali atau mendorong kembali diskusi yang menandem ketika uh, apa namanya uh, isu land uh, akses dan kontrol terutama di dalam kawasan saya yang tiga per empat wilayah Indonesia itu mandek didorong dengan Kementerian Pertanian, tetapi punya peluang di uh, terbuka setelah ada satgas dari ini. Jadi satgas ini juga ber berkolaborasi dengan uh, apa namanya kuat dengan uh, apa namanya dengan sini Nah, normalnya segini tidak hanya menaruh uang ke pemerintah, tapi juga menaruh uangnya mengalirkan uang itu sini selesai. Nah, ditambah polisi besar ini oleh sekolah ki sini sosok Indonesia untuk mendorong kembali apa yang disebut mereka bilang forest tenure reform. Dan mereka punya dokumen, mereka bikin kata lain. Patrick itu salah satu juga masuk di dalam apa namanya koalisi ini tidak namanya di situ ya, tapi membantu di situ. Bagaimana kemudian menjadikan agenda? Ya, jadi apa namanya ini menjadi pendorong untuk kemudian uh, melahirkan beberapa yang namanya uh, turning points. Ada dua yang, yang penting. Yang pertama adalah satu pertemuan di Lombok yang 2011 di mana untuk pertama kalinya 
di dalam sebuah forum publik kementerian perhutanan mengakui ada ada masyarakat dalam hutan. Selama ini mereka tidak pernah mengakui ada desa di dalam hutan, tidak pernah mengakui ada ratusan bahkan jutaan orang dalam hutan. Baru pada 2011, bayangkan sudah berapa tahun, mereka mengakui setidak-tidaknya 33 ribu desa ada di dalam hutan. Ini penting buat civil society karena dengan mereka oke okay, kalau ada orang dalam hutan itu selama ini dia apa yang orang ini? Ya, karena selama ini ilegal dan selama ini di subject untuk kemudian dimasukkan di penjara, di proses dan sebagainya. The second terlalu point yang juga Kathy mau katakan adalah MK35. Semua ini adalah terbuka karena ada tadi project yang concern dengan environment. Kenapa begitu? Karena Argument civil society, you cannot put land unless that you concern about land value. Nah, dengan dua turning point inilah, Aman sebagai organisasi asosiasi masyarakat ada itu kemudian merapat ke badan lain. Ya, jadi tokoh ini digunakan oleh sektor sakti untuk kemudian me, e, berkolaborasi dengan badan lain antara yang terkait dengan registrasi tanah-tanah yang dikeluarkan oleh sektor sakti. Di sebelah kanan itu foto e, Abdul Mabar, teman saya dan teman saya juga e, mel melakukan e, kerjasama dengan e, Bapak Heru. Ya, Pak Heru waktu itu masih jadi ketua badan lain. Uh, dan bagaimana ini penting uh, di dalam perjuangan kelompok-kelompok sosiologi untuk mengembalikan isu-isu lahan uh, pentingnya uh, memberikan akses dan kelompok kepada masyarakat. Nah, di dalam KMP Jokowi, aman secara terbuka melakukan uh, apa namanya uh, pernyataan bahwa mereka mendukung Jokowi dengan harapan Jokowi dan pemerintahnya itu dia akan menunggu proyek-proyek ini proyek-proyek untuk memberikan uh, akses pada lahan nah, jadi kalau kita lihat pada zaman Jokowi Jok, sebagian dari kebijakan-kebijakan uh, SBY diambil BPR digubarkan masukin ke Kementerian Kebutuhan Pemutaran Perlindungan Satunya yang juga itu uh, surprising for civil society BPR digubarkan juga surprising tetapi kemudian ada yang diambil terutama ide tentang memperbesar akses yaitu 12, ini 12, 7 juta itu kemudian menurut saya sebagai sikap sebagai terlalu kecil ya tapi at least lebih besar sekian kali dari pada zaman SP MP yang menjanji sekitar 5 juta ini 12, juta nah, dan ini, ini menurut saya adalah sesuatu yang tidak mungkin dilakukan tanpa adanya diskurs environmental ini. Nah, tapi despite dari seluruh banyak proses dan perubahan yang ada di nasional, pertanyaannya seberapa jauh yang menetes e, persoalan apa namanya kebijakan ini ke bawah di tingkat tapak sendiri itu ternyata banyak hal yang belum e, berubah. Ya. Sampai sekarang meskipun ada jadi progres bawah ada janji tentang uh, apa namanya MK 35 semua itu masih masih punya persoalan dan sampai sekarang hal-hal uh, itu di perubahan ini kata ada lebih baik tapi tidak jauh lebih baik dan tidak progres yang ditinggal tapak itu justru tidak sebesar apa yang ada di, di nasional tapi inti dari semua saya ingin lihatkan dalam paper saya bahwa bicara tentang environmentalism itu tidak bicara saja tentang environment atau bagaimana apakah ada proteksi tetapi ruang-ruang apa yang terbuka ketika sebuah proyek sebuah diskon tentang environment itu hadir di dalam diskos nasional uh, di Indonesia sebenarnya itu aja uh, intinya selebihnya silahkan baca di buku terima kasih I'd like to present uh, use a complementary Uh, topic issues that are added to the issue by the previous presenters. 
we are looking for uh, maybe it has any relation with the discussion in the morning. What was uh, important remark is that uh, we are we Indonesia actually uh, entering a very important development phase where we have to improve our competitiveness compared to other neighboring countries. And what was a uh, great power for governments and uh, the society is how to improve the infrastructure. And in this presentation, I would like, we would like me, uh, Deli Kudala, and two other co-authors, Yuri Nanur Hayati is here, and Tommy Perman. Uh, a few years ago, few years ago, we were focused on a very basic kind of infrastructure that all humankind uh, need is housing. So uh, this is all about it. And what was a uh, bottleneck to infrastructure development, including housing, is in many expert observation is two important things. First is the issue of land. And the second thing is planning. And that is going to be the focus of this chapter is the land side of the infrastructure development. And what would be the main argument in this chapter is that uh, we were focusing on the institutional uh, framework and policy systems regarding this land. And we observe that in, 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 in some points, we see this kind of as the existing infrastructure, uh, institutional framework uh, tend to uh, hinder the uh, process of land and housing development instead of facilitating to happen. Uh, so that's that's the important thing. Is it okay, next. Okay, just next. Uh, so this is the context where uh, Indonesia is now uh, most people are going to live in, in an urban context and we already have uh, housing backlog millions, millions every year and we have many people we live without home and some people, many people live in a very poor quality of buildings and some resulting problems is uh, including efficient land development and this is also important is that these people who live in a uh, uh, poor environment they have uh, bad access to urban amenities and infrastructure and what other issues which is also resembles the things happening in uh, other contexts and other is illegal occupation and this conflict. Next. And uh, the basis of our analysis is based on uh, uh, legal uh, or regulatory analysis and two case studies which were actually conducted a few years ago before the Jokowi terms. And so there might be some updates, but there are some uh, important things that uh, I think is still relevant and, and what is, I'm happy with uh, what uh, what uh, the current government's uh, effort is to integrate uh, land and planning division under one ministry, that's, that's a big step. That according to our analysis in the past, in, in this case, which is 2011, is one of the uh, important recommendation to, to make uh, this the process uh, more efficient. Next. Uh, well, I will not go far with this because it's also uh, presented by the authors. Uh, just to remind that uh, we have uh, going through a different phases of uh, land uh, research and system, and we, we now acknowledge uh, in the regulation is both modern and uh, traditional ownership. Next. And uh, this is also, I'm not going far with this, but what is also becoming the problems in, uh, there is uh, gaps between the system or the legal framework and the practices. Because uh, the policy system, especially the, the, the basic agrarian law, actually trying to endorse more uh, socialistic uh, 
land administration system, while well, the practice is very much uh, moving toward uh, some experts say more liberal. Uh, but what is uh, the problem resulting from this is how many land are neglected because of speculation, for example, and the misuse of land title, land title, sorry, and uncontrolled land market, and we also have witnessed how the 1997 uh, crisis was also partly triggered by this land speculation. Thanks. Uh, yeah, depending on the land, uh, land administration agency is a very still important institution uh, when we talk about land administration in Indonesia. And it has a quite, quite strong task to formulate and coordinate land policies. And BPM is, interestingly, is one of few centralized institutions in Indonesia. And they don't have, uh, they don't have, they are not obliged to coordinate with the local governments. This is under uh, the, uh, some regulations. Uh, and they build kind of a uniform, uh, uniform, uh, regulation across the country with regard to land. Uh, and this is, they represent the central government in making land uh, regulation and policies. And, and this is the context for uh, the mechanics. So just to uh, highlight how important is BPN in, in, in Indonesian land administration systems. And with regard to planning, uh, there is a problem in, in, in general practice is uh, the local government has mostly the, implement, the implementing agency for special plan in, in many cases. They, have, they don't have uh, adequate capacity to implement the plan, uh, especially uh, in this context is, for example, building uh, houses for uh, low and middle income. Uh, and they have fragmented sectoral policies, uh, sometimes overlapping. This is also an overall problem. Next. Uh, next. Uh, this is uh, one of the findings in our case studies in two cities, Mara uh, and Manado, that actually uh, much of the land has been registered and it was our hypothesis that uh, maybe uh, land registration is, is another uh, effort to improve the access of uh, poor people to house. Uh, what is interesting, actually uh, in urban context, many much land have already registered with the bank, at least in these two case studies, so they have a very good security of tenure. But uh, regardless of the fact that much land are registered, we observe many part of the uh, people, poor people actually, live outside this uh, secure uh, land. In dense Kampo, for example, and even squatted in the riverside. And some are informally renting the land from others. Uh, some other because of the high price of the land, they move out from the city and live in the surrounding areas, in suburban areas, and they live in the housing uh, residential areas built by the private developers, and mostly have a poor accessibility and infrastructure. Thanks. So this is just to show how land price in the city is uh, very uh, much different from those in the uh, surrounding areas. Next, uh, this is the situation of where the, in the inner city we see some kampongs and and, and also uh, squatter. And while in the uh, surrounding areas, uh, small houses built by the developers. Next, next. And uh, 
and then with regards to with uh, our objective of uh, analyzing how the institutional and regulatory framework uh, with regards to land in practice, we see that there are uh, the first it was difficult for us to measure actually how pricey or how expensive how cheap uh, to register land especially for poor people it is very difficult for us and, and, and uh, in, in our observation it, it, there is quite varying practices and the overall for example is uh, in terms of time it can be six months or even one year some could be three months so there is no certainty that's 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 the thing there is no certainty in terms of time and price at least uh, and that's quite the problem then uh, next and there is uh, quite minimal transparency with the process if we ask for like a full uh, brochure or whatever you need for you to know how, how is the process of land registration, that's quite quite uh, important to get it in, in the local uh, land offices. And there is a kind of multi-layered bureaucratic procedures. So first you have to go to the very community uh, level, like Kuraha or even RPLW and move up. So that's some multi-layered bureaucratic procedures and uh, some uncertainty in terms of times and fees. Uh, because there are also some uh, imposition of extra legal fees or unwritten fees that you have to pay. And the result is uh, the issuance of permits or land registration is, in many cases, and this is not just according to my research, I, uh, my colleague from uh, the US also, uh, from some other uh, evidence, it, it, uh, it is found that sometimes the land registration is for poor people at least, it's even more expensive than buying the land itself. Next. And with uh, the land development practices, especially for formal housing development by the developers, uh, especially after the decentralization era, uh, there are quite some actors that are involved in the land development process. Uh, from uh, local governments and the and uh, some other next next comments 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 yeah so uh, for example the development uh, permits uh, there is a bureaucracy and it's unwieldy and it may take years for developers uh, and uh, they have lack of existence in terms of infrastructure provision for houses like roads, the cemetery and others. Uh, so there are some delays and to avoid this delay some developers even uh, silently violating procedures so they the, the project can run smoothly. Next. Uh, so uh, what can be concluded from this is that uh, the land, the current land policy, at, at least from our survey uh, in 2011, is, is uh, one of the main obstacles instead of facilitating uh, the housing development. And there are three key challenges uh, unclear property rights, and then inefficient land development, and lack of uh, human and institutional resources from the state agencies. Thanks. Yeah, I guess this is the last slide that I just give it maybe for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,